Hi, we're glad you're here today. We want you to feel welcome. This church is a place you can call home, where you can grab a cup of coffee and meet new friends. Today, we're going to sing together, not because we want to be entertained, but because we want to give glory to God. Today, we're going to learn together because we believe God still speaks through the Bible. No matter where you are on your journey, no matter what's in your past, at this church, you are accepted, you're cared about, and you are loved. Thanks for sharing your day with us. Welcome home. Well, good morning, church. How is everyone doing? Hi. Are you ready glad to you're worship here. the Lord today? Isn't he so good? Isn't he so faithful? Come on all the time. Amen. Oh, we worship you, God. Come on, let's sing it out. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth? Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Let's sing it out. This is, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay, you lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, we give you glory, Lord. We worship you, God, who brings our chaos. Who brings our chaos back into order. Who makes the orphan a son and daughter. The king of glory. The king who rules. Who rules the nations with truth and justice. Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings let's sing it out this is this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down you lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Yes, we do, God. Worthy is a lamb who is slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy is a king who conquered the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Yes, he is. Worthy is a king who conquers the grave. Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Worthy, 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 oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would, that you would take my place. 
that you would bear my cross. You lay, you lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Come on, can we just do that? Sing for all that he has done for us. With thanksgiving this morning, God, we lift you up, Lord. We worship you, God. You're a good God. You're always on time. You're always faithful, Lord. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, God. We honor you. We bring you glory, God. You're so good, God. You're so faithful, God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here in this place. We worship you, God. We worship you, Lord. Come on, we're going to sing it. It says, there's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence lord come on every voice to sing holy spirit holy spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Come on, there's nothing worth more, amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. You're my living hope. Your presence, Lord. Come on, I've tasted and seen the Lord's goodness, amen. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence, Lord. Come on, let's sing it together, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Oh, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and Let us become, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Oh, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are well. Sing it out. Come flow. And fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be overcome. 
your presence, God. Oh, we love your presence, God. Come on, it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So we cast all of those burdens on you this morning because you are capable, you are able, God. And we lift up the name of Jesus in this place. There's no higher name, there's no higher name than the name of Jesus. Oh, we worship you, God. Amen. It's good to be in his presence. Amen. of this song it says do it again it just reminds you that he's always faithful every situation every circumstance he's always faithful amen come on let's sing this out together walking around these walls i thought by now they'd fall but you would never fail me change, waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, for you have never failed me yet. Come on, your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. Hallelujah. Come on, that's good news. Amen. you're still enough keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again come on your promise still stands your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Oh, your promise, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. Your hands. This is my Let's sing this together. I've seen you move. I've seen you move. You move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it.
You're faithful every time, God. Come on, let's just relax in his presence. You're faithful every time, God. You're faithful every time. Every minute, God, every hour. You're faithful every day. Come on, aren't you glad that there's nothing too hard for him? Amen. Nothing confuses him. Nothing throws him off, off pattern. Amen. He's full of goodness. We worship you. We trust your word, God. We trust your promise, God. Come on, sometimes we just have to choose to hold on to his word. Amen. Just hold tight to his word because it outlasts whatever we're going through. Come on, that's good news. When he says the joy of the Lord is our strength, that means we can hold on to that. We've got access to that promise any time of the day. Amen. things in this world that can give us the opportunity to talk about whether it's a sports team or our job or this or that but God we want to exalt your name God above everything else God we want to be the loudest that we can for you God we want to bring you glory today Lord and we will rejoice and be glad in it we will rejoice and be glad that this is the day that the Lord has made we're gonna be sour the Lord has made we're gonna be sour and depressed Lord, this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because we know good things are ahead. We know that we can trust our Lord, our Father, our Creator, God, the one that knows every hair on our head, God. We trust you with this year, God. We trust you with this day, God. Come on, let's just give him the rest of today. Give him the rest of this week. Give him the rest of this month. Come on, he is capable and he is able. He's big enough. He's good enough. He's strong enough. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord, we worship you, God. We worship you, God. God, we trust you, God. We trust your word. We trust your promises, God. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, it's just good to be in his presence. Amen. Come on, everything that comes from him is good. Every time you're in his presence, you can be strengthened. Every time you're, you're exalting his name above all the other things that are happening, just something happens, amen? Something eternal happens. It's bigger than that moment. You are lifting up the name of Jesus that was, that is, that will be. You're lifting up his word. You're lifting up his promise, amen? So we love you, God. We honor you. Thank you, Lord. We just bless you, God. You don't have to do anything for us, God. We just love you because you're good. We love you because you're just so amazing, God. And we lift up the name of Jesus in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated.
Father God, you're an awesome God. You love us. You see us every day. You walk with us. You're always beside us. You promise that. We know that you give us gifts through blessings, finances, whatever it might be every day. We thank you for that. Now, as we offer what we have, our first fruits to you, we ask that you would bless it and that you would bless the giver. And we pray all these things in your son's name, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. for hours. And uh, actually, I just got a text saying that they couldn't hear me. Um, I, I uh, watched for hours and, and he would play on and on by himself and he was okay with that. But let me tell you, solitaires got nothing on poetry with ne for Neanderthals. With a group of people, it is a lot of fun. It lifts your spirits, it makes you laugh. There's nothing better than laughter. And then I have to tell you, I had a panic attack my son bought me a Diet Coke, and I couldn't get it open. And I had to ask him to open it, and he couldn't get it open. And it took a set of vice grips and him and I together in community to open my Diet Coke. I was grateful for community. Community is there sometimes when you don't even expect it. Commun it wasn't this one. Community uh, is so important to us. And so this week, as you go throughout your week, look at places for community that you don't expect to see it and see how you can involve yourself in community. So our scripture that um, we're looking at today, there are two of them, but specifically um, I'm going to look at a different one. I think Pastor Terry is looking at um, First Thessalonians. So I am going to look at Ecclesiastes 4. And it says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. And if one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls down who has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And yet a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. See, one is okay. It's a little lonely, and God created us to be in community, so then there are two, and two is great, but if you've got three, it's even harder. Now, I'm telling you, I have this thing that I will often walk out of the house with one tissue in my hand. Now, one tissue, if I take one, you know what? I need seven. I need seven because one is just never enough, and especially this week, it has been absolutely awful. I've just sneezing and runny nose and everything. And you know the great amazing thing, Mr. Kleenex, I don't know how he did it, but look, this is what's amazing. Watch. There's another. And there's another. And you know, and just in case you can't see it in the back, I'm going to hold it up. They just keep coming. Now, why is that? Why do they keep coming? There's more. That's not it. Why? It's the way they're folded. They're connected. <coughs> they are connected together. 
They, I have to use them now. Now, nobody used any that was in this pile. It just popped all over it. They're connected. They're interwoven. They're made to lift each other up. They're made to bring joy. Though we may use them when we cry or tears of happiness, of course. But, you know, that is how we are, to be interwoven enough to lift each other up. We don't know when somebody needs to be lifted up, but that smile that we have might be exactly it. That how are you today and just listening might be the perfect thing that someone needs. See, you know, you never know when you need to come alongside. See, the scripture tells us to come alongside, to be in community, to help our neighbor, to be with those who need us. There are so many people in this world who have no idea that they need anyone. I'm often reminded of a story. One time my dad held the door open for a woman, and she goes, I can get the door myself. And so he just let the door go, and it hit her. And she was a little offended. He said, listen, I thought you were going to hold it. I'm sorry. You told me you could get it. I let the door go, and I went on in. You know, you can't be upset when you say you don't need help. You know, we just want to be kind and loving. And then we want to get mad when people don't come alongside and be kind and loving. You know why? Because we were meant for community. And we don't always know it. And sometimes we think we can do everything ourselves. Sometimes we think it's better if we do everything ourselves. Because we know the right way. But you know what? There is no right way to come into fellowship with one another. It is loving and putting your arms around each other. This week, as you are looking into um, things, make a note on your, on your bulletin near the um, announcements. These are some people I'd like you to pray for. I'd like you to pray for Skylar, who's traveling. She's there with her dad. She's the one who texted me and said she couldn't hear me. Um, good thing I watched my phone. Um, and then uh, her dad, Tommy, and his wife, keep them in prayer this week. Remember Roxana and Monty um, this week? Remember Lynn as she's making some big decisions in her life that God will guide her to the right decision. If you'll remember Matthew as he goes back to school after a very long break, his very first day for really four reels on the job, uh, just uh, pray for a great day for him. Um, as he goes into all of that newness in his life. Um, I just pray, uh, if there's more on your list, if there's more that I've missed from um, the uh, app, please let me know. Share that with one another. This week, we will be back. It is so great, more than anything, to know that our prayers for Joyce that we've been praying for. She is well enough to be with us today. So hug your neck, hug her neck, not your neck, hug her neck, and let her know that we are so glad that she is back. But we will be meeting tomorrow for Bible study. Um, and then um, we also want to welcome back Nancy and Dan who've been cruising the world. And so uh, make sure that they know that you love them and you are glad they are back in our fellowship. Um, we will be then having um, morning worship next Sunday, but on Thursday also we will have prayer. Our, our prayer time will be on Thursday night at 6, Bible study at 6.30 on Monday, and then we'll be back together again for morning worship. And then put on your calendar, the 18th is our family fun Bible study and potluck. So come prepared. We will be meeting in the potluck room uh, on the, in the other portion of the building. So uh, come prepared just to have fun. We are going to have a blast. Just come out to see what the new year is bringing in for community. This is the time on Wednesday nights when we have our family fun time to bring somebody who might not be interested in church. This is the great way to get them to show up and say, tonight we aren't going to preach at you. We are just going to have some fun. Good, wholesome fun. So come out and we'll be a part of that and uh, that would be great. Men's uh, fellowship will be on the 21st on the Saturday and women will be back together on the 28th. Um, and so uh, that is if I've recovered from Boots and Bling, which I'm sure I will be. We're going to have a great time doing that. Um, let's pray. Our Father, we just thank you so much for the amazing things that you do in our life, that you have created us to need someone beside us. How much better we feel when we know that somebody's beside us or behind us who's got our back. 
Lord, I just thank you so much for all the answers to prayers and the, the, the things that you do, Lord, in ways that blow our mind. And Father, for the names on our list, Lord, that you will touch them and let them know that this morning you are real and show to them the plans that you have for them and allow them to wrap their head around what it is that you are doing in their lives. And Lord, we just thank you so much this morning as we look for community this year. In your name, amen. Happy 2023. I haven't seen some of you since last year. Uh, I, I am recovering from the mission trip, I will tell you that. And, and don't even go to Sharon after the service, and let me just say this, and ask her what poetry for Neanderthals is. She's not going to tell you because one of the things that we are going to start doing is inviting families over to our house, and we're going to play that game, and I don't want to give it away. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing, and I am quite good at it. That's why I'm in support of that game, yeah. Uh, community. Uh, it, it, it is important, and uh, I was reminded of that in our prayer time this morning when uh, Bob brought up a scripture, Psalm 68, 6, that says, God sets the lonely in families. That's just the first part of the verse. You know, it goes on and it says that he leads out the prisoners with singing. And then he talks about the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. He's not talking about Texas. Okay? It's, it's more sun-scorched than that, I believe. I don't believe they ever get days like we have today uh, where he's talking about in the Psalms. But he sets the lonely in families. Why is that? Because it's important. Because it's needed. It's necessary. Um, and, uh, and Bob, thank you for that reminder. Uh, another thing for community. I am reading, was it Thursday or Friday, I think I got, I got an Amazon package. And I said, oh, I haven't ordered anything from Amazon. I thought I'd been hacked. I opened it up, and there is an NIV Bible in it with large letters. Thank you, Darlene and Joni. That was a wonderful blessing uh, and a surprise coming back from... Uh, from my mission trip to find that uh, sitting uh, on my doorstep, and I just lost my, it's really kind of um, amazing, but I just lost my scripture, because I wanted to show you that other one. Um, uh, anyway, I'll get to it. Uh, community. This, this week I also did something that I haven't done in a very, very long time. I went to Starbucks because I got a gift card and I had a cup of coffee, but I got the very expensive coffee and I sat down and I, and I was reading and, and writing on my iPad and it was midweek, midday. And as I'm watching, there is a steady stream of people coming into Starbucks, not just to grab a cup of coffee and go, but to come in and to sit down, to have meetings, to, uh, to, to meet with their friends, to have business meetings. There, there were students in there, uh, you know, getting prepared to go back to school, I guess. And uh, it was just busy in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day. And I thought, that is really something. I was thinking about this sermon. I said, you know what? Starbucks has done something rather interesting and incredible. 
They've created an environment that draws people to it, a community, a culture that, that people don't mind paying 5 to $8 for something that we used to pay a dollar for. They don't complain about it. They walk into that environment, that atmosphere, and they're happy. And they walk out, probably because they're caffeinated. Yeah, broke, that's right. <laughs> and, uh, but they're still happy. They're all right with paying $8 for a cup of coffee because they're getting value, not just from the coffee, but from the environment, from the community that they have created. And I realized something as I was looking at Starbucks. You know, where do we used to go for community you know, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, used to go to bars, you know, cheers, where everyone knows your name. Uh, we used to go to cafes. If you watch Seinfeld, George and Elaine and Jerry meet at this cafe all the time. And then, now we've got friends who meet in a coffee shop. And uh, you like that? I did three sitcoms that I thought you all would miss. Uh, but Starbucks has created that community. It shifted from those places to now it's a coffee house, and they're popping up everywhere. Even in the mission trip in Mexico, the church that hosted us, they have a, a business of roasting coffees, uh, coffee beans, and, um, and serving coffee in this little kind of annex on the outside of their church to help fund their church ministry. And the pastor told me, because he realized that I might be a little bit addicted to coffee, um, he uh, told me that they're buying a, a, a coffee farm for $10,000 on the coast of southern, southern coast of Mexico, uh, just two acres. But it's enough that they can more than triple the amount of coffee beans that they, that they get. And um, uh, it's, it's creating an environment, a community for them. And yes, I have some coffee of theirs at my house uh, right now. It was well worth it. Um, I also realized that Sharon, in community, when we're talking about community and being excluded and being left out, Sharon has never felt that, ever, even as an only child. Maybe because she's an only child. Uh, and, and it's a secret that not many of us uh, know about, but whenever she is by herself, she talks to herself, sometimes when she's with other people, too, now. And then she answers herself. So she has conversations, you know, and you think that she's on the phone or something. One night we had people over, and she was off in another part of the house, and they heard her talking, and they said, oh, I didn't know you had other people here. And I said, you know, we always have other people here for Sharon to talk to, even when there's no other people here for Sharon to talk to. And I explained the situation. She has never felt like some of those people she's talked about, or the scripture in, in Psalm, where she is lonely or by herself. Uh, and that's something that I sometimes uh, envy in her. See, because when we were in seminary in Atlanta 30 years ago, I was uh, a Yankee in Atlanta in seminary. Normally, you know, we go wherever our jobs require us to go, right? Whatever we need to do to get the job done, we go there. My sister, she, you know, thinks she was smarter. She went to Chicago where people speak like her, and they understand what cold is. That's exactly why I didn't go to Chicago. They understand what cold is. And I knew enough about the Salvation Army to know that they did things in the cold called ringing bells and Christmas kettles. And I said, I'd much rather be in Atlanta than Chicago. And I was correct on that one. But I was also a Midwestern true blue corn-fed Iowan who went to the military as a musician. And, and I was new to not just Christianese, but I didn't understand the culture, this culture of the Salvation Army. You know, the acronyms and all the stuff that they used. I knew some of them because I went to music camp when I was growing up. But I was an outsider in that culture in so many ways. 
And I can tell you that those first probably nine months were the loneliest nine months of my life in seminary because I didn't have community. I was alone. I was an outsider even there in that environment. I was in desperate need of a, of a friend, of friendship, of support, of a network, of fellowship, of community. And it was very, very lonely for me. See, Sharon knew the Salvation Army life. She's a third-generation Salvationist, what they call a, in the South, they call a blue-blood Salvationist. Yeah, it's getting a little cold in here if you want to, for real, adjust. <laughs> uh, she was a bl- what they called a blue blood in uh, Atlanta as far as Salvation Army circles. So, multi-generational families, she knew f- people even in Atlanta because of that culture. And so she was connected to other people. I, I was not. And, you know, Sharon's also creative and crafty and has all these skills and abilities that the Salvation Army values greatly, not just the organization, but people in there. So she had connections and things. All I had was music. And even that, in regards to connecting, was some viewed as a a negative thing. Because here I am, what they would call a mill boy. Because I was not a multi gener I was a new salvationist, first generation. Uh, here I am, a mill boy, coming in as a trumpet player, and they looked at me in that, you know, kind of music mob mentality as he's a threat because he's going to take one of our positions in the music mafia cartel of the Salvation Army. I guess you've got to say that like you're from New York, you know. So what you doing here? You show me your instrument. You tell me what you can do with that. Yeah. So I was even, I even felt like an outsider there. As a matter of fact, Sharon and I were talking about this. I'm a trumpet player. In one group, the, the leader uh, asked me, kind of told me that I was playing tuba. The trumpet mouthpiece is like this. The bell of my uh, trumpet it was about the same size as the mouthpiece of the tuba. They, that, it's, I was an outsider. And I, it was the loneliest that I'd ever been since basic training, when I first got to basic training. And it was not uh, fun. So have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever been there where you're on the outside looking in, where you're ostracized or isolated, all alone, deserted, lonely. I think we all have experienced that at some point in our lives. Uh, Maybe it's coming off of the holidays. Maybe it's with family. You know, I know some of you made decisions in your lives, and and it's moved you to the fringe of your family. Some of you for decades... And even when you are invited to go to family things, sometimes you felt like you're not really welcome there. Or maybe relationships, friendships that have soured over the years just because of time or distance or decisions. And you feel alone, excluded, left out. Maybe it started in elementary school when you were picked last for dodgeball How many of you remember that? Don't tell me that you were always picked first. Or in in junior high, because you got facial hair before all the other guys did, and Madeline Firsty calls you Harry Terry, and that stuck as your nickname. Oh, that's too personal. There are times, my point is this, we've all experienced times in our lives when we felt like we were on the outside looking in, when there was no community that we felt like we could be a part of, no connection, no support, no family. And it's not a good place for most of us to be. And it may be happening now in our culture more than ever before. Joyce said she got a new doctor this week, and she uh, uh, 
asked her a lot of questions. And one of the questions she asked is, are you volunteering? Why is that important? It's important because we've seen through the pandemic that when we stop doing things to engage ourselves with other people and we isolate ourselves or we have to be isolated because of a pandemic, it's hard on us. We aren't wired to be by ourselves all the time. It's not good. And that's why she's got a good doctor. Ask her those questions. I was going to go to that doctor, but Sharon says I can't. She says I'm too healthy, and she may be, uh, uh, I don't know. We're divided as a country, too. You know, there are those forces outside of these, these walls that really uh, set up a narrative to say we're polarized. You either believe this or you believe that, and those are the only options, and you don't intermingle with people who believe differently than you. What do we call them? What do they call them? Enemies. They're your enemies. If you have a different opinion of someone else, you're their enemy now. Whereas before, it was just, you know, Oh, you know, Terry, he has some strange ideas, but we like him because he's short and he drinks a lot of coffee and he's entertaining because he drinks a lot of coffee and he's short. <laughs> but now the world has set it up so that we can't fellowship with people who think anything different than we do. You know, those are called echo chambers. Those are dangerous places to be. They, they want us to feel that way. They want us to make us feel as if we are the only ones experiencing whatever that is. Loneliness or exclusion or political views or opinions about the weather or opinions about any number of... You fill in the blank. You can probably fill out more of them than I can. So if you turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, we see what God says uh, through His Word and through our favorite uh, apostle... Um, Paul, about community. And Thessalonians is such a short book. There it is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I did have my little tag there. Verses uh, 12 through <clears throat> 18. Excuse me. And we'll be reading, I'll be reading from the NIV, which will also be up on the screen. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love. Because of their work, live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, giving, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Lord, speak to us as we look at your word for a few moments this morning. Speak to us through your word as it flows from your throne to uh, to your children through a, a broken vessel. Forgive me, Lord, for my sins, for they are many. And, and we come to this place, Lord, to see Jesus and to see him risen. And it's in his name and sake we pray. Amen. This, this passage is how God solves the problem of, of loneliness, of being left out, of being excluded. Or another way to say it is how God says to build a community that lasts. Now I'm going to skip over the first couple of verses because it's all about how you're supposed to uh, affirm and appreciate leadership, the pastors and the leaders of the church. And that would be self-serving, wouldn't it? And you know that you all are smart enough to know that pastors work more than one or two days a week. Sometimes we work three days. I'm kidding. I really am kidding. However... If you look at verse 13, the second part of that verse, it says something very important. Live in peace with each other. That's not meant for people outside these doors. That's meant for us. He's talking to the church, to believers. 
to Christians at this point. Live at peace, in peace with each other. Be at peace among yourselves is the literal translation of that verse. Now, we know how to not make peace, don't we? <laughs> we and we're pretty good at that. Gossip and lying and manipulation and, and uh, uh, cheating and going to bed angry with each other. Manipulation, all of those other things. But how does God say that we should make peace? How does he say what we should do in order to make peace? Well, verse 14 says it, right? Uh, it, let me just say that Paul's primary concern for this church in Thessaloniki, easy for you to say, is uh, idleness. See, they were so focused on Jesus returning that they said, don't worry about working. Just stay close to the church. The church will take care of you. Jesus is coming again. We don't have to worry. Don't, don't put money into retirement. We see that even today. Don't worry about tomorrow. It's kind of like the, Jesus is coming, don't worry, be happy. And, and so Paul is addressing that, doesn't he? He hits it hard. He says, no, no, no. Warn those who are idle, or the other word is disruptive. Those who would divide. You know, that's the idle hands of the devil's playthings, that cliche that we... He's, you know, I used to say to my staff, um, when I'd walk through the door, I'd say, look busy, I'm coming. You know, when I was the boss, you know, now I say to the kids, look busy, your mom's coming. We need to stay busy in the work that the Lord has called us to do. We don't check out of life. And that's what Paul is saying. That's the, the main issue that he's dealing with here when he talks about idleness. But he's also saying, put your arm around those who are in need, those who are weak. Help them. And when it says, talks about feeble, it's not talking about just physically. It's also talking about their faith and their position. He's saying, take care of those who are, who are under trial and tribulation and in need. And then he says, don't lose your temper with anyone. This is to all of the above, all those, those uh, good things and, and warnings. Those are to us inside the church, the Christians first. And then verse 15 says, I think it's important to see what Paul says about holding one another accountable too. And right here he says this, be accountable for good behavior. Always strive to do what is good for each other first, once again, within the church, and then everyone else outside the church. Look after one another here in this community, here in this faith family. So first at home, that's where it starts. Cultivate a culture of love and helpfulness and forgiveness and patience at home and let it overflow into this faith family. And from here, take it outside those doors. But you know what happens when we start to do it here? Outside these doors, they see it. And they say, I want to be with a group of people like that. I want to be in that community. And then we got verse 16, which says, always rejoice. Any questions? Okay, good. Verse 17 says, unceasingly pray. Any questions? Good, but let's go back to that. I want you to do a search this week. Google it. I all, you all know what Google is. And yes, they're watching you. Big deal. You're not doing anything that you shouldn't be, then who cares if Google watches you? Oh, no, they looked at my kitty uh, videos. They, the government knows that I'm watching dog videos. You know, I'm not worried about it. Google how many times Jesus went off by himself to pray, to be with his Father. There's quite a lot, quite a number of times. Pray without ceasing. Any questions about that? Good. And then verse 18. Give thanks. In everything give thanks. Not just give thanks for the good things, but even those things that challenge us. Even those things that are a little bit difficult to handle. And why? Second part of that verse says, because it's God's will in Christ Jesus for you. For you 
Specifically, it's God's will for us that we give thanks in everything, that list from above. To quote that, that great saint and philosopher, Bill S. Preston Esquire from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, 1989. Be excellent to one another. That's, that's biblical. Bill didn't come up with that. God did first. Be excellent to each other. You can go watch that movie uh, again if you want. It's only one little part, but anyway. So if that's the command from God about how we build community, a community that lasts, we've got some work to do, don't we, in the church royal, but also with each one of us. If God says this is how the church should look and this is how the church should function and we don't resemble that in every way or every manner, then what steps do we take to get there? Here's where we are. This is where God wants us. What do we do to get there? Well, Let's, uh, let's go back and, and take a look real quick. The insiders, you and I, Christians, believers, the church, the saints, we should live in peace with each other. We should warn those who are idle or disruptive. We should encourage and help the, the weak and the, those that are in need, those that are under trial and tribulation, and we should be patient with everyone. Hold accountable those that you care about. That's what accountability is for. If I'm standing next to you on a street corner and there's a bus barreling down the street and you're about to step out in front of that, I'm going to grab you, maybe violently, to pull you back out of the way. Why? Because I don't want you to get wiped out by stepping in front of a bus. That's accountability. We hold one another accountable because we love them, because we care about them. And then... Always do good for each other and everyone else. And then he says to rejoice and to pray and to give thanks. Always, every minute of every day, right? Did you notice something about that list? Aside from the warnings that there's danger out there, I'm not even going to say accountability. I think accountability is a very, very good thing, a very necessary thing in the world and in the church today to help people who are putting themselves in danger, maybe unknowingly. But if you looked at everything, everything that Paul talks about to build community is positive. It's not negative. It's encourage. It's give thanks. It's pray. It's, incur it's uh, uh, be patient. Well, some might say that's not positive. It's do good for one another. I mean, Paul's not saying, you know, Go get that fat head that said bad things about you and key his Prius. Yes, he drives a Prius. Or, or vomit all over Facebook about your neighbor's dog barking all night long and keeping you awake. Or criticize that, that individual or that politician or that political party that doesn't do the things that you want them to do. Everything that Paul says in this letter to build a community that lasts is positive. It's encouraging, and it's something that we all can and should be doing to get from here to here. If we just closed our eyes and imagined what that, it's not hard to do, what that would look like today in the world, think about all those things. Can you imagine what it would look like if we did that? We're well on our way within Living Word Church. We've got some things to work on, but we're well on our way because we find out just from a comment in a sermon that our pastor needs a Bible with a bigger letters, and maybe some pictures in it. We find out when someone's sick and they need a, a card sent to them just for encouragement to say, we're praying for you, or a text message. We find out when someone is, is maybe too sick to cook meals for themselves and we make sure that we get meals to them. We are well on our way to building a community that lasts. But could you imagine what it would look like if we, Living Word Church, did all of those positive things just like this passage says? 
That would be incredible, wouldn't it? It would be amazing. It would be countercultural. And the everyone else in, in verse 15, they would come in close to be a part of a community like that. Remember, a friendship begins when someone says, wait a second, you, you feel the same way? I thought I was the only one. That's when friendship begins. There's a connection that's made that's very, very powerful. We're, and remember, we're all looking for community. We've all been in some situation or some time in our lives left out, ostracized, alone, and lonely. We are all looking for community, a place to belong, a place where people accept us as we are, but they love us far too much to let us sit back and stay in that place. That would be an epidemic of epic proportions. It would be an infection of affection that affects everyone in a positive way. And it would transform not just how we do church, but how we do life with one another. Can you imagine what that would look like? Well, that's what God is building here and what he wants to build everywhere. Community. How do I know that? Because it says so. Right here in verse 18. In all these things, give thanks. It is the will of God for you. I will tell you that those first nine months were pretty lonely for me in seminary. But after that, I met someone that I had absolutely nothing in common with. He was six foot two athlete. I was not. I was a musician. He couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. He was from mm, Florida, I think. I was from Iowa. Where was he from? Oh, Mississippi, Biloxi. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we did have something in common. We both dated the same girl. He married her. I escaped and married way above him. <laughs> I like how I did that. See, We didn't have anything in common, but we connected on one thing. We were both tech geeks. We were nerds. And we became best friends even to this day. I found exactly what God had for me. Friendship, a community, a family. We may go through those periods of isolation and loneliness, but God is preparing us for something better, a community that lasts forever. Can you imagine? Father, we thank you for this time together. As we move into a new year, into 2023, we don't want to continue as, as we've done in the past and expect different results. Lord, we want to listen to what you say you want your church to look like. We want to do exactly what you say your community within the church should look like. And we want to become that community community that, that holds one another accountable out of love, a community that encourages, that always does good, that is patient and kind and generous and understanding. We want, Lord, the community that you created, and it is your will for each one of us to be a part of that community. So give us wisdom when the world outside tells us that we are all by ourselves and no one else feels that way and we're alone. We know the truth. We see it in your word. We know the truth. We see it in our lives. We know the truth and we see it right here. So right now, Lord, we pray uh, for the strength to come alongside those and put an arm around those who need to be lifted up, those who need to be encouraged and, and held on too tight, those who are struggling with financial problems and family difficulties, health, sickness, maybe 
and just loneliness. And we would ask, Lord, that you would give us the ability to see and the desire to meet those needs and relieve some of that, uh, that fear and anxiety and pressure in those that we love and care about. Here first, Lord, within this fellowship, and then we take it from here outside these walls. Lord, be with us as we go through this week. Give us opportunities, as Sharon has already uh, talked about, to find community, to create community. Be with us in all the events and the programs that we do, that the purpose of those things aren't to be busy, but it's to point people to you, to build your kingdom, and to show people a better way, a better way of life, a better way of living, the only way. Lord, comfort the lonely, strengthen those that are weak. Be with us as we walk through life together as your family. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue in worship, it is, we are going to be taking communion. So if you're watching online, Skylar and Tommy and the family, uh, just grab whatever you've got nearby and, uh, and we'll take communion together as a faith family. Uh, so if it's, you know, white bread and Diet Coke, Sharon would be very happy. Then you grab that. Communion, as we all know, is an opportunity for us to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. On the last night, before his crucifixion, he stood before the disciples and, and they were breaking bread, having a meal. And it's, the Bible says that he broke the bread and he blessed it. And then he passed it around to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. Every time you eat, remember the sacrifice of my body that was broken for you. And then he said, this wine represents my blood. Every time you drink, remember my blood that was poured out for the remission of your sins, forgiveness of your sins. So communion isn't a magical thing, but it is a sacred thing. Because in the hearts and minds of all of us who follow this little Jewish carpenter, we remember the sacrifice that he has made for us through giving of his body. That sacrifice, to many, this has just become another thing that they do at church. But it should always remain special to us. Every time you get together with friends and family, when you pray, it's more than just that. It's remembering Christ. Just as Jesus said on the night before his crucifixion, and he broke bread, and he said, remember my body that was broken for you, Take and eat. We take and eat and remember your sacrifice, Lord. And on that night, he took wine and he gave it to them and he blessed it. And he said, just as my blood was poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins, he said, remember every time you drink in fellowship with one another, the sacrifice of my blood. Take and drink. Lord, we remember. Sometimes with pain in our hearts because we know that we've let you down. Sometimes with joy because we understand that even when we let you down, you love us all the more as your children. Remember your body and your blood that was broken for us, that was poured out for us, that allows us to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father and to live in heaven in eternity with you. Help us to cherish these sacred things in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, Joe will pronounce our, our blessing the other mic. Oh, there it is. 
Remember the events for this week, and remember the 18th is our potluck. It's not the first because Sharon allowed me to recover from the mission trip, and uh, we, so we will have our potluck on the 18th. You'll get reminders about that. God bl- What time? Six. Okay, 6 p.m. Miss Nancy said. Whatever it says outside on the door. Oh, okay. It says 6.30 on the door? Okay. Well, if you come at 6, you can bring some for me to test for quality control. Uh, Joe, if you would pronounce our blessing and benediction.